today in episode 151, we're talking about the best tech for teachers in 2022. Now, I think a lot of us are understandably feeling a desire to push away from tech and move toward books and notebooks and pens and pencils after two years of Zoom and Google Drive everything. But it's all about finding the balance and using the truly unique tech tools that can do things paper can't. I'm so excited to have Jennifer Gonzalez here from Cult of Pedagogy to share with us today. Not only does she run the incredible blog and podcast, Cult of Pedagogy, but she teaches a popular online course on teacher tech called Jumpstart and brings out her incredible Teacher's Guide to Tech, which I have found to be one of the best PD options out there each and every year. Are you ready to learn with Jen? Let's dive in. Hey there. I'm your host, Betsy Potash, and one-pagers, project-based learning, and choice reading are my jam. I believe in you, and my goal is to help you explore all the creative possibilities you dream of for your classroom. I'm an educator, a chocolate cake aficionado, a traveler who can't wait to get back to Barcelona, and the kind of mom who brings her own mini makerspace to her kid's classroom when she comes to volunteer. I know this for sure, creativity isn't always easy. As a creative teacher, you get parent calls you treasure and plenty of sidelong comments you'd rather forget. But here's the bottom line. Creative education can ignite a spark in your students and change their lives forever. You and I know this. You're an innovator. And while it's sometimes hard, it's so worth it. So let's explore the world of creative education together. Welcome to the Spark Creativity Teacher Podcast. Well, welcome back to the show, Jen. I'm so delighted that you're here. Thank you so much. I'm I'm happy to be here. We've been partnering up on a couple of things over the past couple of years. Yeah, and it's been so fun every time. I'm really excited about the new Teacher's Guide to Tech 2022. I mean, it's not new anymore. It's been around for a couple of months, but I don't think that changes the quality of its greatness. Mm-hmm. No, no, it's still pretty current. I mean, we're already starting to like work on next year's, but oh gosh, what's in this amazing. year's is, yeah, is very current. It's amazing. Well, I've been like knee deep in it, loving it so much. And I wanted to do something a little bit different with this show because as fun as it is to sort of go through and ask you for your favorite tools in different categories, like the Grammys of teacher tech, <laughs> I kind of want to just put some situations out there to you as if you were teaching in like all these different fun scenarios. It's kind of like a game we're going to be playing today yeah. where I where I throw a scenario your way and then you tell me how you would use the guide to um, make this scenario wonderful. <laughs> Does that sound awesome. good? I think it's, yes, I think it's a really cool idea. I'm ready. Okay, great. Well, <laughs> um, hopefully this is going to be fun. So in our first scenario, First of all, your name is Lindsay. I think that's a crucial detail. Okay. You're, new, you're new to a school that's mm-hmm. teaching a pretty standard sort of canonical curriculum. And you'd like to diversify the text you're using. You'd like to have more modern mentor text so it could bring more voices to your students. But just the thought of trying to find them all online is overwhelming you. So how could you use the guide to tap into um, modern mentor texts? So there are two places in the guide and basically all of my answers are going to basically point us back toward the guide. But um, one of the things that we have in this guide is uh, all of the tools are broken into different categories. So the first thing I would do is go to the content libraries section, which is all of these different websites whose main basic goal is to just curate lots and lots of great content. So some of them are Um, text, some of them are videos, some of them are podcasts. And so I would start probably by exploring that. Probably start with Common Lit because Common Lit does a really beautiful job of not just finding different texts for certain topics and standards, but pairing them then with other media so that you get this really rich sort of like layered experience on, on a topic. But then the other section that I would look at, since you mentioned really wanting to diversify, is we've got a section on uh, social justice and anti-racism. And in that section, there's a lot of stuff that has to do not with text, but with you know activism and advocacy. But there are several uh, listings in that section that are specifically for diversifying materials in the classroom. So for example, uh, there's a website that is called 1001 Black Girl Books. And this is just a teenager whose goal was to just try to 
increase awareness of more and more titles where the main character was a young black girl. Um, and then there's another one called Diverse Book Finder, another one called We Need Diverse Books. And so these are all websites whose primary mission is to do exactly what you said, to find more diverse texts for classrooms and for readers. Yay. <laughs> scenario one solved. <laughs> I love it. Okay. In scenario two, mm -hmm. you are right in the thick of the year. You've been busily engaged with your students on some projects. Your ninth graders are actually writing children's books for the kindergartners in your neighborhood. Your 12th graders have been writing poetry and they're asking if they can bind it together as a collection. And so you're like Googling, how can I publish student work, publish children's books cheap, <laughs> but like mm -hmm. your Googling isn't paying off. How could you use the uh, tech guide to solve this issue? So we actually have a whole section called book publishing. Oh, really? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and so pretty much all of the options in there uh, are for digital books. So putting something into a, a final co uh, copy that would be something accessible online. But there are a couple that also give you the option of publishing physical books. So one is called Blurb, where you go in and you lay out all the pages yourself, and then you can pay to have a physical book printed. Um, one of the features that we also have of the guide is that we'll feature a tool, but then underneath that will list however many similar tools out there also exist. So there are probably a lot of people that have heard of Shutterfly and chat books. It's that kind of a, of a place. So um, Students can go there or teachers can go there and do like a class anthology of um, poems or shorts or something like that and publish that as a physical book or for much less money and oftentimes free, they can just keep a digital library of finished pieces that are on there. But Blurb is just one of the six tools that we feature in that section of other um, book creators. And also there, there's another way that you can even publish a book to sell on Amazon. So oh, wow. that's another one of the tools out there. If somebody wanted to go that far with it. Oh, cool. That could be like a really intriguing fundraiser. Mm -hmm. If parents wanted to buy like senior poetry collections or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Very mm -hmm. cool. All right. Moving right along into scenario number three. I think a lot of teachers are in this scenario right now all over the world, but Let's imagine you are Lisa and you're in a school that's really struggling to bounce back from COVID. Like the students are just down and they've been struggling for a long time and the teachers have been struggling and you've kind of made the decision that you're, you're going to focus on SEL and parent outreach and you're just going to stay in that lane for a while, mm -hmm. but you don't really have the background in that. Like, yeah. is there a way that you can use the guide to give yourself some concrete steps? Yes. So one of our new sections this year in 2022 is social emotional learning. And so we've gathered together some tools that are specific for that. Uh, there's a few that are specifically offering curricula that you know, lessons that you can do with students on those topics. Um, there's another site called along.org, which is a teacher to student sort of check-in video tool where you can sort of leave video messages for individual students on topics that you want to talk about. Um, and then we also have a whole parent engagement section that has different platforms that teachers use to reach out to parents. Um, so, you know, one of those is Blooms, where it's sort of a whole parent management system. You can communicate things that are going on in the classroom. You can send messages. Um, you know, parents can reach you through chat and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, and another tool that I really like is called Talking Points, which will allow you to communicate with parents who do not speak English. So you can send messages and then have it translated into uh, the parent's native language. So that can oh, also really, amazing. really help when you're dealing yeah. with families where English is not the first language. As a person who is frequently holding up my phone right now in my daily life and being like, mm -hmm. this is a description of the haircut I want like, <laughs> at the haircut place. Yeah. yeah. That's super cool. I love that. Okay. All right. So moving on, scenario number four. Um, now you are Brett <laughs> and you have recently done a current events project with your students that gave you some serious cause for concern. You feel like they 
aren't picking up on cues for fake news. You feel like they are not at the level of digital literacy that you thought they'd come to you Mm -hmm. at. Um, And so you're just quickly trying to put together a unit to upgrade their skills, but really like you're digitally literate, but you're not totally sure how you became digitally literate Mm. and you would like somebody else to help you figure out how to teach it. How can you use the guide? So we have another one of our newer sections is media and news literacy. That is specifically, and this has really been a need more and more in the past couple of years as there's just so much information out there, but not everyone knows how to tell fact from fiction or stuff that's just heavily biased. So the tools that we have gathered here are, some of them are just tools where you can look at two different versions of the same article written by different publications or the same topic and sort of compare. Um, One of those is called All Sides, which will actually take three articles, one that's from the far left, from the far right, and from sort of the center. And you can even tell just by looking at the headlines on the same news story, how vastly different they're Mm -hmm. presented by different um, news outlets. Um, And then there are some that are, that all offer actual curricula that you can do more structured lessons. Common sense education is one of those um, so that you can uh, not just use tools out there, but actually have a plan to teach students stuff that's a little bit more structured. So that's, um, that's a really good, um, a good section with lots of good resources out there. Yeah. Yeah. Super helpful. Okay. So now you're teaching in a very small town and you feel like your students are a little bit isolated. They have not had a lot of opportunities to travel. They, they sort of, they need more doors and windows, not just in their reading, but even in just their communication with other people. How could you use the guide to try to figure out ways to connect your kids out to the world? So they, we've got, I've got two sections that kind of connect with each other, but the one that I thought of right away was the global learning section, which is, it was originally combined with the language learning section, which is, you know, tools for students to learn more language. And we put global learning with that, but then eventually both sections got so big that we decided to separate them. Um, and the global learning is just basically sites that are meant to do exactly that, uh, help students build connections with people in different parts of the world. So um, one of them is called Empatico and their whole goal on their site is to basically do sort of matchmaking between classrooms around the world. And those students have video chats and they, you know, create like pen pal situations and you sort of form a relationship with this other school um, in another part of the world. There are a couple of other sort of pen pal related um, sites that are also there. there's the global read aloud, which a lot of people have heard out where the whole world reads the same book. And then you kind of like join each other on social media to talk about it. Um, And then Flipgrid also has developed a lot of like pretty cool sort of international events that people can jump on and connect with other people. Um, If someone actually is learning another language, then some of the language learning tools out there are amazing because, you know, you have your Duolingo, which is just exercises to learn the language, but then there are also websites where you can set up an appointment. There's one called (laughs) italki, where you set up an appointment with kind of not a tutor so much as somebody who's volunteered to have a conversation with you in their native language in exchange for, so you'll talk in, in, you know, 15 minutes in French, and then you'll talk in 15 minutes in English and you both get practice. So you're actually getting real practice with a with a live human being having <laughs> a conversation. So, cool. <laughs> so, so these really can, you know, offer all kinds of, of different, really interesting opportunities that just break down geographical barriers like crazy. Yeah. That's so amazing. Hmm. I try to do some of that matchmaking in my Facebook group sometimes, and it gets so complicated because there'll be like 30 people in 30 different parts of the world with 30 different needs. And I would think yes. a website that was designed to, <laughs> to make to those matches yeah. would be really fabulous. I love it. <laughs> All right. Now here's a scenario that I think a lot of my English teachers actually do find themselves in frequently. Um, And it goes like this. Your name is Sarah. 
<laughs> you're working on a podcasting project with your students mm-hmm. and it's so fun. You were really excited about it until the day that they got so into it that they started to kind of get past what you were ready for. And they're like, we need music. We need a platform where we can publish. Yes. We, need, we want to be famous <laughs> podcasters. <laughs> can you help us? And you're like, oh man, I'm really good at Vocaroo and, you know, a quick audio <laughs> recorder, but I don't right. know about this. So how can the guide help us? So we do have a whole podcasting section. And, um, you know, one of the things also that I have in the guide is that I've written a lot of articles on cult of pedagogy about some of these topics. Like I did a whole long article about how to start your own podcast. So that article is not in the guide, but we we link to it in the yeah. guide and say, Hey, if this is information, go over here. If you need information on the legal use of images for your cover, for example, go here. And so the guide itself actually has more in it than the guide has actually yeah, in the pages amazing. of it. It's, <laughs> it's loaded with hyperlinks to a lot of other resources. So in the podcasting section though, we do feature, um, advice on, you know, finding music because there are sites whose whole goal is to just house music that is royalty free, copyright free. It's public domain stuff that you can use for your, your intro and outro music, which is especially helpful if you're a student. Right. You know, and the other thing too, that a lot of teachers need to think about is that sometimes something is being done just for school which doesn't have nearly the same amount of laws attached to it for in terms of copyright. It's, you know, you can almost get away with anything if it's just yeah. a school project, but sometimes students will do something for school and it turns out great. And then suddenly they've thrown it onto YouTube and they've, and all of a sudden it's like, wait, 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 that's a copyright violation. Like, now <laughs> you that you're actually Taylor publishing Swift. it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we may as well teach them now about legal use of things so that they don't end up putting all this work into so Cause you don't really get in big trouble. It just gets taken down. Yeah. But what a waste of energy and work to, to do something that you now can't do anything with. And so it really pays off to just teach them. So I've listed places where people can go to find those assets that they can add to things like podcasts. Um, and, and it's all legal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like it just gives more weight to the project too. If you say like, we're going to go ahead and do this so that if it's incredible, you can be like, right the new up and coming youth podcaster in the gaming yeah. scene or whatever. Like yeah. that's awesome. Why not lay that context from the beginning? Absolutely. And it, and it happened. So yeah, yeah. it's definitely not far-fetched for sure. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, in this scenario, your name is Hamilton and it's clear to you (laughs) that visual literacy and visual communication are really important in the English Mm -hmm. world. You are on board with that. You want your kids creating infographics and social media Mm -hmm. graphics and you, you want that at the same time, you have like no idea of the design principles because that's not in your background. And so you want to help kids be effective with their visual communication, but you don't really want to get another degree. How can the right. guide help you? <laughs> we have got so much stuff in the guide for visual stuff. We've had to break it into so many different categories. So we have a section that is just art, and that is only for when people want to make their own digital art. And that section is crammed full of all different kinds of tools and apps for students to make the stuff, which is probably the in terms of legal, that's probably the best way to do it because then you're not yeah. worried about stealing anyone else's stuff. Um, there is a whole section uh, that is called images and icons. So a lot of those icons that you see on websites and stuff to click on this, like you can grab those from um, from some of these websites to use to sort of build artwork also. There is a whole section on infographic makers. These are websites that are just designed for um, helping you create infographics. Um, And also in the art section, I forgot to mention this, it's not just art like painting and stuff like that, digital painting, but it's also graphic design tools like Canva, which is gets so much of the work done for you in terms of setting up templates and stuff like that so that students can see something and say, okay, I want something like that. And then they can basically just go in and judge it up to make it their own. And then there you go. So there, there's a ton of stuff out there for art and graphic design that not only does the teacher not need to know anything about art, but the students themselves don't have to have any particular special talent 
they can still, you know, find a lot of great stuff to make their, their things look really good. Their, you know, their podcast covers, for example, or, you know, video slides or whatever it is that they're putting together, they, they can find great things. Yeah. I love that. And I feel like it is reflective of professionals in the field too. I mean, everybody's looking for those pre-designed beautiful templates that they can just tweak like Mm -hmm. it's not even cheating (laughs) it's the way the world actually is I made this go ahead and use it and and yeah yeah, make it your own so yeah it's pretty great yeah there's almost no excuse to not have stuff that looks pretty good now because it's just all out there Yeah. Yeah. Did you know that Canva started as a yearbook design tool? No. Yeah. I heard their founders interviewed on how I built this and I, I loved it so much. They were just like trying to make it easier for people to design nice yearbook pages. That that's no, I did not know that. It's so funny because this past year, the guide was getting so overwhelming for me to keep updating that this past year, I hired a small team of people to work on it with me. These are all four of them are like digital literacy people. Like they, they're the tech people in their schools and they all are the biggest fans of Canva. They're just like, did you know Canva can do this? It can do that. It can do this. Like, oh, you use Google slides. We use Canva for our presentations now. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, you can create video with it. Now you can do this. And it's just like, Wow. And it's yeah. as a yearbook tool. Yeah. Yeah. I literally use it for everything. I'm like constantly contacting them and being like, you should sponsor me. Because- Same. <laughs> I've tried to, to get them to sponsor my podcast. I'm like, I am the biggest fan. I could write the script for I you. Know. Me yeah. too. It's amazing. <laughs> Okay. All right. So who was that? That was Hamilton. Oh, we're on to our last person. Mm -hmm. Her name is Juliana. I mean, your name is Juliana. (laughs) This is a fun one. As Juliana, you're actually the perfect teacher, which must feel good for you. (laughs) Everything is ideal. Every course is perfection, but you have one free day tomorrow with nothing planned. How would you use the guide? Okay. So I would say that probably the thing that I just think is one of the coolest things on the internet is called Google Arts and Culture, which I got to go to my index. This is the other thing that I like about my guide. I end up using the guide all year <laughs> long myself because yeah. you know you learn about a tool, you put it in there and you sort of forget like, is it in the guide? Where is it? So I I have every tool that's in the guide in the index with a hyperlink to the page that yeah. it's on. So it makes it easy to find it. So it looks like I have it in the history and social studies section, but it's so much more than that. So it's arts and culture that the word and is in there, artsandculture.google.com. And this place is just, I described it originally in this history section as, you know, a collection of, you know, historical documents and primary sources and stuff, but it's really so much other stuff. It's it's photos, it's artwork, and you can actually collect things yourself. And then they also have experiments that you can do. Like, for example, you can take a piece of fine art that's like really famous and they can turn it into like a coloring page for you. And then you can like just digitally color it yourself. Um, They can turn it into a digital jigsaw puzzle. So you can play with it like as a jigsaw puzzle. Um, they've got other tools where you can take famous works of art and, and zoom way, way in and get like a really detailed look at like a corner of it. I don't know. It, I haven't even scratched the surface on what you can do there. And because it's Google, they keep adding stuff anyway. But, you know, if you go to that site and just there's, there's something in the side tab called experiments where they've just got all these funky little things that they're doing because they have all this stuff, all this data. So they have figured out now like, oh, we're going to mix it up this way. And we're going to let you do this this way. Like you can choose a a piece of historic art, for example, and it'll do like, I think it's called like a thousand degrees of separation. They'll, They'll put a almost like a timeline of it, of like, here's all these other pictures that look similar to it that are also kind of famous. And I don't know, it's hard to explain. It's one of those places where you can just explore. Yeah, it sounds so amazing. I would probably, as a teacher, I think I might give maybe four or five different little sort of scavenger hunts or, or projects or something for students to, to do just to, just to play around with what's possible. 
they're doing a lot with um, artificial intelligence now. And like, I don't know, it's just a really neat place. So yeah, it yeah. sounds incredible. Yeah. It could be writing prompts. Honestly, they could, it, you could go almost in any direction with it. So How yeah. Cool. yeah. <laughs> well, I love learning about that. Um, Jen, that brings us to the end. You have been eight different teachers in the last half an hour. <laughs> you must be feeling a little scattered. <laughs> Feels like the end of a teaching day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Well, thank you for coming on. I know I'm going to be linking the tech guide in our show notes mm-hmm. so people can go and check it out, but they're also just going to want to learn more from you generally. So tell them where to go. So the best place to start is to go to cultofpedagogy.com. That's C-U-L-T-O-F-P-E dagogy.com and from there there are links to all of my other stuff to social media and to the podcast and so on so that's the place to start perfect i know they're all already clicking (laughs) (laughs) thank you (laughs) thank you thanks so much for having me on thanks for joining us today Head over to the show notes at nasparcreativity.com to see the visuals for the tech tools we discussed and check out all the links. You'll also find more information about Jen's amazing 2022 Teacher's Guide to Tech. Until next time, take care of yourself and stay creative. Stay creative.